everybody. We're gonna talk about the Franken theme. Um, I'm assuming most everybody here at one point or another has either inherited or created a theme of their own that is a collection and a assortment of themes. Whether that is something that uh, you are happy and proud of or something that you are trying to survive through. So we're gonna go through a little bit of that. But first, because this is after lunch and you are, are probably a little sleepy, we're gonna do a, a little bit of a dynamic by raising your hand. Um, raise your hand if you like learning from others' mistakes. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> raise your hand if you had to deal with theming issues that seemed like a good idea a year ago. Because, you know, I mean, Raise your hand if your theme is clean of skeletons and workarounds. Ooh, yeah. You have to be very confident and a little cocky to be like, yes, my theme is great and it doesn't need any changes. Raise your hand if you use a contributed theme before. Oh, that's good. Raise your hand if you use WordPress and Joomla themes before. Because that's a slight different experience, and if you were on the recipes initiative yesterday, we're going to see a little bit of that when we look at these examples, uh, when it comes to like what distributions do and how they have in the past kind of given you a similar experience, but unfortunately with some of the negatives that come along with it. I mean, there's positives of distributions and profiles, but you inherit more concerns that potentially are worth if you're trying to do something simple. Raise your hand if you're creating a new theme. Ooh, because I know that's a, you know, a little bit of a controversial question because some people are just trying to survive and trying to make it through the next stage. Uh, if you worry whether you are following, raise your hand if you worry whether you're following best practices and are setting yourself to be better off the next year. I mean, I've been there myself, you know, you, you hope and wish that everything that you did is going to be still cu be current and the technology is going to be relevant. But sometimes, you know, it, what seemed good last year, this year is just technical death and something that you either have to rip out or flatten out or give to somebody else if you're lucky and then you can move on. Uh, raise your hand if you have less than four years of theming experience in Drupal. Anybody will? Oh, cool. We have a couple of people. If you are a full stack dev, ooh, how many people consider themselves just a front end dev? Not full stack, just front end. Cool. How about a back end? But you still came because, you know, you, you want to learn a little more and then you want to see what's out there. How about if you're an expert on CSS architecture and BAM and SMAX and some of the other stuff? Because, you know, being an expert on CSS specifically can be a little tricky because even if you do things right, you're working with other people. And if they start doing things differently, uh, well, you end up a little bit a spaghetti code. And that's where sometimes people tend to uh, rely on either Bootstrap or Tailwind or something else that gives you that flexibility, but also uh, allows you to level somebody else up without having you write a big document and why not now have you thought on this before where is my drupal support group because you know you've probably been there it's late at night and your thing is not working yet and you thought oh there must be an easier way because usually in drupal there is an easier way but you may not know it yet or you thought uh we need more time but either your bp or your boss is behind you or the designer who has like 50 variations of the thing and then you have to tell them why they should probably settle down for a couple variations of it and sometimes at least in my experience accessibility can be your friend because telling a BP to wait for some other reasons sometimes they'll get the better results but and it's not that you're gonna lie that it's not accessible. You can just tell them that you wanna focus on making the few variations as good as you can, and that you don't wanna have any lawsuits or any concerns, and usually that will buy you the time that you need to improve those and give yourself a little easier time now and potentially later when you come back to it and then you have to fix something. You guys probably heard this phrase before, 
I will fix this later. Ooh, that's a dangerous one. I've been there, I've been there. You know, you hope because you did a prototype that your prototype was gonna be redone and that there was gonna be time for that. But no, you know, uh, you launch that prototype and two years from now, you're gonna come back to that and be like, ah, oh, okay, well, I guess I have to fix my own technical debt. Or, or sometimes you have a little shyness and share to shame to share with other devs the ugly workaround that you had to do to fix that one thing that you did early on because either maybe you didn't know better or you thought that you will get a chance to redo that section because it was just a prototype. Um, this also emphasizes a little bit the need of local and remote meetup communities. If you don't have one, I know here at the university it seems that you guys have a strong group. If you don't have them, make sure you attend some meetups because that's an opportunity to get to know other people, but also share some concerns about layout builder, paragraphs, which one you should go for, which uh, trade-offs you have. And sometimes uh, personal uh, and maybe biased uh, takes on some sort of a contributed theme or something else or the company behind them. I should uh, clarify, uh, even though I might give you a little bit of my personal um, bias uh, opinion on some of these, I'm grateful for the work that a lot of these open source developers and companies have put out there. It's just, you know, you kind of have to have a perspective on it, whether it's a good perspective or not. Regardless of that, their contributions have made it easy for other people to level up and for us to learn about how they do certain things. But that doesn't take away from the fact that some company cultures make it a little harder and make it so a project can be abandoned two years uh, on after you took it and then now you are either maintaining your thing and their thing or uh, trying to move away from it. So that's something to keep in mind. Also, make sure that you try to not over engineer a project because what is the goal of uh, any themer and any developer overall we are supposed to chip a product but sometimes i think we forget about that and we end up going for whatever seems like the coolest technology <laughs> and we get stuck down the weeds so don't get stuck down the weeds with that said um something that i uh, i help uh, with ddev and i have with a couple of other things Something that I wish we have, and I think is gonna be more emphasized as uh, we move on, is something like what Laravel has done with the build with Laravel. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but let me show you that side. And I imagine at some point we will have it as well with Starship coming in. Something like that for about Edidev and also Drupal. Something that highlights some of the pages. We have case studies. So there are certain things that Drupal has done, but there's not like a modern way because there's plenty of government sites, plenty of private sector sites that use Drupal, that use it in an open source kind of way that are even MIT licensed or GPL2. But if you don't know where they're at, you cannot really look at their code or you cannot explore it. You cannot really see what theme hooks they're using and you are not able to take advantage of whatever uh, thing they built and put out there. Now, for my examples, I'm using DDEV, which I'm a little biased because I help maintain their website. But if you never use a local development tool, uh, take a look and explore it. It could make your life easier when it comes to like having the website run on your machine. I mean, you can run it in the cloud as well. There's not a problem with cloud development versus local development. It's just another power tool. Like the same way as with theming, you try to learn one thing at a time, or actually there's multiple learning paths for that. And I will cover that in a second, but you know, uh, something to keep in mind. If you do use DDEM, uh, actually, how many people here use DDEV? Ooh, how many people use Lando? Ooh, how many people use something else? Oh, that's good to know. Uh, so it's quite a balanced room, but if you do use DDEV and you are trying to install any of these projects to check it out, cause you know, I don't know about you, but I like examples. I like to see what other people have done, how they build it, kind of reverse engineer my way through it. And if they have default content, you know, that's fantastic. That's like kind of like the goal right there because then it makes my life easy and I can turn some things off and see which things I want to keep or not. 
So one thing to keep in mind is that you have a command nowadays that not everybody uses and ddev tries to, tries to give you a suggestion and that is ddev config update. What that does is it updates your config.yaml. So some projects use doc root and some projects use the web folder as the main source. So that will do that for you and also sometimes go to settings.php and switch it up so it loads the data based on the local development environment. You can do that manually, but sometimes you have that issue that you try to open an example and the example is not working. That's something to keep in mind. And also, Composer Create versus, versus Composer Create Project. Create Project is an older version of Composer Create and sometimes DDA will give you some recommendations. So if you see create project, you can just use a create. Also, as I'm talking today, if you have some comment, anything to add on, uh, feel free to speak up. I know in the past, I've given some presentations where there are some people either in the front row or the back row that has some insight about something that they did or that they can relate to, and that just adds to the conversation. You don't have to, but uh, uh, I was doing one presentation in Asheville and then just having a little bit of a back and forward or a side scenario where you can relate can add up to the experience in the room. So let's start looking at one of the examples. Open Y, who is familiar with Open Y? That is a distribution from the YMCA pips and uh, I don't even know if you knew that the YMCA uses a distribution. And that distribution has the three themes inside it, Open Rose, Open Carnation, and Open Lily. Um, in its current iteration, it uses Bootstrap 4.6, Webpack 4, and something that I like is that it provides default content. And I will show you that in a second. Uh, but something that I thought was cool too is that the first time you install it, you get these terms and conditions, which I didn't see in some of the other ones. And I think this is kind of clever for them to just be like, oh, you know, remember what open source stands for. Don't try to sue us because this is all the stuff you're taking on. You're free to use this example and acknowledge the stuff. And you cannot really get away from this page and try to go to content. That page is forced upon you. So, you know, you may want that if you are releasing something open source. So let's go see the example. So here we go. So this is a default version of that. And I was playing with this earlier, so let me switch it back to English. So that is just uh, one module in Drupal, the translate module, which you might have seen in some higher ed websites and why not. But anyway, I'm currently logged in, but if you install this distribution and you create the profile, it does all of this for you. I didn't do any of the setup. I just install it and run it on DDEV. You have different cards. You have a couple of heroes, you have a couple of highlighted sections, even have some views. I don't know how many of you have tried to theme a view. There's so many different ways of theming a view. Some ways easier than others. I mean, you can have a view mode that you theme. Sometimes that's easier than actually uh, theming the raw view itself. The raw view itself can be a little tricky because it does a little bit of recursion. And if you're not familiar with that word, that's just where it iterates over itself since it has so many different elements and it has to uh, get some elements out of the SQL query. So now right here, we have some cards, we have some tags. Now you look at this and you think, hmm, maybe I could use some of that for my side. But the first thing I usually get curious about is, what is this? Is this a paragraph? Is this a content type? Is this a layout builder? How did they actually structure the page? Because in Drupal, unfortunately, sometimes as a themer, you end up dictating the architecture of the site. And if you do, you have to uh, contain, well, you put yourself and your team uh, at risk of having too much and using it too little, because sometimes paragraphs makes it easy to embed content inside. But if you heard talks about paragraphs before, you shouldn't have too many uh, things embedded inside of paragraphs. Paragraphs in itself is not bad. Layout builder in itself is not bad, but you should know a little bit of the trade-offs of what you get with one and the other. Some of the things when it comes to uh, um, primarily language translations is something that is a little better in paragraphs and why not that in layout builder. But layout builder is fantastic 
It's just, you know, something to think about. Not necessarily go for the easier way, go for whatever seems more practical. But let's take a look. So then you have the content. You already have default content. Like this, I know Martin was showing a little bit about recipes. Um, I wish he had shown a whole site like this, kind of like put up together and then maybe change the default theme to something else. Because that's what I'm expecting recipes is going to do pretty soon and hopefully by the end of the year. So with some of the other themes that I'm going to show you, you will be able to have some of that and then go into uh, a content type and then just click edit and see what's inside of it. I mean, have some default stuff, see if you like this, if you don't like it, if you have to change something, see what you have to change, how where to change it. Something that I usually do when I'm experimenting with a new theme is I go to appearance. And then I look at what was installed in here, or what was added. I originally didn't think there were so many different themes. This one is the current one, but you can see that you have like these extra ones. And sometimes that is because since they have a distribution, sometimes they release a new theme, but they don't want to break backwards compatibility. So they just release a new version of the theme. But that is some craft that you inherit if you have their distribution. You wouldn't have that with a recipe, but with a distribution, sometimes you get locked into whatever they're doing on their old theme or whatever restrictions they have on the composer packages that they have in there. So I usually go in here and then I take a look at their settings. Why do I take a look at the settings? Sometimes you find little nuggets of information in here that you could reuse by just looking at their settings files. And you might see something in here that you never seen before. You, I, I, every now and then I'm surprised by something that somebody put in their theme settings that you are like, oh, well, I guess I did that the hard way. Um, so that's certainly something to keep in mind. And besides that, let's take a look at the code. If I make it a little bigger, there we go. So, some things to look at when you're looking at a new contributed theme that you are exploring. And I call this Franken theme because I think <laughs> all of our themes are kind of Franken because we're bits of pieces of stuff that we ripped out of something else. Uh, but, you know, like in this case, I'm looking at like what libraries they include, how they are actually adding Bootstrap, or what kind of like uh, compiler they have or build tool, because I don't know about you, but Webpack can be a little hard to set up. If you are trying to set up Webpack, sometimes you have a your time sending something like Gulp, depending on what you're doing. I do know Beat is also out there, and Beat is a little nicer in some ways, but it also adds extra complexity to your project. So if you are doing it on your own, uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve, sometimes the less sexy tool will provide you with all the things that you need, and without the complexity of you having to scratch your head when they switch from Webpack 4 to 5 and half of the stuff doesn't work. Because, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I did have a theme that I had extended from 4 to 5 and they changed how the entry looks and some of this stuff. And the problem when you are doing a, a, any theme in general is if you borrow something, you know you're going to own it. <laughs> like that thing stuck with you. I mean, the day, I mean, the day you got it, it was working and you hope that in the future it will keep working, but that's only until an update kicks it out. So there's that. So I usually go into the libraries folder and then I take a look at what's being pulled in, how they are pulling in the JavaScript, what are they using? And this is just a good practice if you're trying to do something unique in your theme as well, because uh, Drupal.org and the documentation for it is fantastic. But sometimes it's not fully up to date, unfortunately. We need more people adding stuff in there. And there's nothing better to get a working example on how to override some sort of file that's coming in from a contributor module or something else than actually looking at it and seeing an override. And I don't think this one has it, but some of the other examples might. Um, but yeah, so there's that. There's the themes file, which you probably are familiar. Now, something that I've seen in themes file in the past that I, I thought was kind of unique and I added a little bit on this is how you deal with SVGs. Because SVGs, sometimes people want to have placeholder text and there are modules to do that. 
And then, you know, Drupal has the same, there's a module for that. But sometimes you don't have to add the module because it's fairly simple that if you know the hook and you know what to call, you could probably onset that variable and then just make sure that, you know, uh, you kind of follow and have some uh, if statements and why not to not run into any issues. But you could make uh, what that module does for your project in a simpler way that is easier to maintain. So I always go to the themes just to take a look at and see what I can get out of this. Sometimes you get more, sometimes you get less, because it sometimes it's very specific to the project. But as I'm going to show you later on the example that uh, Drupal Commerce has, they have something in there where they actually uh, pass the path to the theme to JavaScript. Now, I don't know if you ever had that issue, but like sometimes if you're doing a decouple block or something in JavaScript, you need to know where your theme pad is. Because you know that needs to ask it some resource. You could hard code that path, but you know somewhere in the future that thing is gonna break because the path might change slightly, uh, whether you're moving host or doing something. So if you can have some sort of variable, you are a little better off. So there's that. The, the other file is usually the info.yaml. You wanna make sure that uh, you have kind of like a good base theme if you're trying to acquire one of these because sometimes uh, contributed projects can have a base theme based on the craft that they already inherited on. So they might be inheriting another version of itself and just extending it. And if you get that, now you are having to deal with potentially another set of skeletons that they have. So get the benefit of it, but be aware that if they're already setting up a base theme and it's not stable nine or classy or something else that comes from core, you may be putting yourself into a little bit of a pickle because now you are hoping that they will maintain that project. And open why I know some of the people, if you come to Midcam actually, there's a couple of them that work there. I know Avi and a couple of other people have contributed to this. Uh, so you can uh, know more of them and a little bit more of like their culture and some of the stuff that they do and why not. So that's that. So let's go back to the slides. And I should probably start going a little faster. Uh, so USWDS base. This is a different one. Anybody here use USWDS? That's the United States Web Design System. We use it for a contract that I'm on right now with uh, the Small Business Administration. It's fantastic. Getting started with it can be a little tricky because if you go uh, to their website, you get something like this which is kind of like what you get with Bootstrap and kind of what you get with Tailwind and some other things. Uh, just a set of components that you can use that are already checked for accessibility and a couple of other things. But then you think, oh, how do I use that in Drupal? How does that come along? Well, there's a couple of projects that actually already do some of that for you. And one of them is the USWDS base. That's not the only one. You could have a couple of others. But if you take a look at that one, that one already, I didn't do anything to this one. If you, use US, if you use USWDS, this is what you get out of the box. I usually like when they actually set up some of the regions for me, because like you have Radix and other profiles, and sometimes they don't do much when you install them. So you still have to poke around, and if you don't know enough Drupal, you are like, oh, you know, which thing do I need to actually override? What are they providing for? Now, what is this missing? Probably a recipe, because it'd be fantastic if you actually had some of the stuff that I just showed you on the open Y thing, and it showed the different cards for USWDS. But if you go to appearance and you go to settings, you notice there's another different setting here called CDN settings. And this is actually defined on the your themes file that I was showing you earlier. So you could see how he defined this. And actually settings for a theme are like the easier thing to define in Drupal. Sometimes if you have to define a field widget or a field formatter and something else, you have to know a lot of PHP code. But at least for themers, this page specifically, there's a couple of shortcuts that you can take to just like have uh, something with the name of the field and then just acquiring the information of it. And he right now is just using this to bring the latest version of USWDS 3.8 the latest major version and and yeah there's a couple of settings in there that you can change the agency just play around with it reverse engineer it um, and see what you can get out of now 
learning paths. I wanted to talk a little bit about this because some people learn bottom up, some people learn top down, and some people are feature choppers. Uh, maybe there is more than that, and I want to explain a little bit about that. So you could try to, if you're a themer that is where uh, that is experienced or not, to learn all the systems. You could try to learn all the Drupalisms, PHP, Twig. Take your pick. You could try to reverse engineer existing systems. And uh, either way, I, I don't. I wouldn't say that is a right answer, but at least for me. Uh, what I found most productive over the last five years, I kind of started around 2018, was doing a mix of both. Because then you get some of the, oh, this is what I need to learn now, but also let me see an example of something that is kind of related and kind of similar. If you don't do both, it's going to take you forever to go through and learn the old systems. Because some people like to do that, but Drupal, Drupal in general is very big and very large, and PHP is very big and very large. So learning what you need when you need it and sometimes reverse engineering something that is already out there will simplify your life and give you an easier time uh, feature shoppers what is that uh, I used to work for a university before the job that I have now and with universities you have a BP and the BP tells you go do a new theme and you're like what do you want on it and he's like I don't know I just want a good looking theme and accessible one thing you can do is you go out there and find out what themes use Drupal or not, because we have the advantage that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are usually available on the browser, and you can actually look at the different components and take things that you like. And sometimes, if the BP is a little older, I will print it out and be like, you know, which item do you like, which component, to just kind of get an idea, especially if you don't have a designer that is right there with you all the time. And even if you do, some designers come from a graphic design background, which is a little unfortunate because then they don't know about the limitations that the web has and some of the accessibility issues that that can generate. So you can uh, give them like, oh, okay, well, let me see which one of these I like the most. Like the top ones, both Princeton and UC Davis use Drupal. I don't know if you knew that, but if you don't, now you do. So you can inspect the HTML and see if they're using paragraphs or layout builder and then kind of, you know, they take a... Uh, make some of your decision making based on that. The bottom ones are government sites that use 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 USWDS to some extent, um, and sometimes they have like an example that is a, a nice and it kind of showcases what you need. So what's a little bit about bottom up? Bottom up is you trying to learn local development, a little bit of Lando, a little bit of PHP, a little bit of Drupal hooks, and a couple of other things. What is top down is you deciding that you want to use Tailwind CSS on your project. You want to use progressively the couple blocks. You want the gene admin theme because it looks nice and the VP likes it because it's a little sexy and want a newish. Uh, you want to use Webpack, Beat, Gulp, or Grunt. Usually, Beat, if you went to a computer science school and you use some front end framework, you're gonna be familiar with Beat, and then you probably want the gym admin theme, and you probably maybe want Tailwind, and then you're like, that's the stuff that I want, you know? But <laughs> leveraging your wants versus where you start and how much experience you have can be key to actually having a successful theme that doesn't have a lot of skeletons in the closet. Now, some uh, resources. What's out there and what has helped me, at least in the last five years, learn a lot about theming? Drupal TV is your friend. All the recordings that we're doing here and all the other cams will be there. If you learn better by watching videos, there's thousands of stuff in there that I picked up over the years. And um, yeah, if you just go to Drupal.tv, you can see the different cams. If you can have a Drupal Ask Me account, that also helps you. But then you also have some books, and I highlighted these two because these two books, the Drupal 10 module development, which also had a Drupal 9, will show you a lot of the back end and some of the back end that you may need as a themer. Sometimes you don't care about that as much, but if you work for a university, you are technically full staff. I mean, full stack. And let's not lie about that because it's very likely that you're doing a little more than just theming. And then the modernizing Drupal 10 development book. Get the books. I mean, some people don't get the books because they just want to learn from Drupal.org, and sometimes you have to buy it on your own money because, you know, it's hard to convince the university to buy some resources sometimes. But getting the books will set you up 
uh, to do it faster, to follow best practices, to have less errors, and hopefully for you to keep your job. Because you know, like if you if you don't deliver something successful in six to eight months, and you're on that journey, your BP is gonna be a little stressed and start questioning a couple of different things. And then there's also like the different classes that you can take. If you're fortunate to take Drupal Easy, which is my Canelo's company who is around here, then that will speed up your learning or the Debug Academy. The only thing is, you know, not everybody can afford that and sometimes it's hard to get your BP to approve some of that, that stuff. So if you couldn't do that, start with the top. That will simplify your life and potentially get you uh, into theming and into kind of like when you need a little faster. Now, theme requirements. What you likely need, you probably need responsive images. Let's not lie. You start a theme, you need to figure out what, or what, how to get them responsive because you don't want to use a gigantic file on every page. But you don't know how to set that thing up because maybe you haven't done it as much. And then you have your theme.breakpoints.yaml file and you're like, oh, what the heck, how many breakpoints do I need? I actually added in the footnotes or towards the bottom of the slides a couple of examples. This presentation here, the YouTube video, and this blog by Mario kind of go into details. You kind of sometimes have to know the people who are uh, big into front end theme and recognize them so you can inherit some of their practices and save yourself some time. And sometimes it's just a combination of like thinking what's going to come ahead and you know trying to modify and, and deal with it as it comes. Usually, you want to have an internal page, uh, and then you want to sign up for that. If, if you never use the easy breadcrumbs module, depending on what you're trying to do, that can simplify your life. You want a homepage and a couple of components. And uh, I took a little sample of the Twin Cities Drupal Camp. I know uh, Dan was talking about volunteering. You know that if you volunteer with a camp, sometimes they give you access to their Pantheon account or whatever to help make changes. That gives you access to that theme, which is based on the Florida theme, which is uh, has some of the code that Mike Herschel added in there and why not. We use it also for the Chattanooga Drupal Camp. So not only are you helping them with something, but you are learning yourself from what some of the pros in Drupal are doing. And, uh, and as you can see, that theme is not super complex. I mean, how many elements does this theme have? It has six components over there in that corner. But if we were to sit down and try to come up with those ourselves really quickly, I mean, how much will that take? Because usually getting started is the challenge, especially on a theme. Like changing how the theme looks and modifying some of the components, that's a little easier. And that's why I think that theme has been very well uh, adopted and tweaked and why not at different camps. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's only like 13 internal pages. But if you can play around with this theme, and actually the Florida one is an open repo. So we're gonna look a little bit about that. So what are some reasons that uh, you may care about this? Because either you are new to Drupal, you are looking for real world examples of some things that people have done. Your front end skills could use a tune up. I mean, hopefully you have been keeping up with front end, but uh, front end changes and also the field that you might emphasize changes a little bit if you decide to go more for the bundler side of things of front end, the back end of front end, the front end of front end, the architecture of the site, and also like if you're vice president and head of Drupal and they are sitting on your lap. Because you know, you had that, that type of boss that's sitting on your lap and you are like, oh, so how do you start doing this? Look at that, all these projects are open source and have a GitHub repo and I put them towards the bottom of the page. You have emulsify for kitchens. Uh, you may want to be uh, a little disclosure about emulsify. I put it in the slides because I checked them uh, back in 2018. They used to be one of the bigger ones with particle phase two. But the problem is that this company sometimes sponsor their developers to work on their projects. But two years from now, you never know if they will still be around. Particle unfortunately got abandoned and then Wingsuit to cover it, but now it's kind of mostly abandoned. But it doesn't mean you cannot take a look at their source code and maybe find some hooks, find some integrations that are valuable for your theme that can save you time, because some things in Drupal have a longer lasting life, inside, even inside of theming. So that's just something to keep in mind. And then you have more examples. Barbase, which is part of Bardot, has their own distribution, which I will show a little bit at the end. 
lining which is abandoned I also had a couple of different hooks that you could look at and why not so if you're using hooks you can learn a couple of different tricks from in there the Florida Drupal Cam 22 is the repo that Mike opened up that is on his uh, github profile that's not fully up to date because he usually keeps it up to date on Pantheon and I actually have helped with a couple of things there but uh, but I mean every now and then he does an upgrade and a new release but Let's be honest, how many times you have to change your theme settings or something that is architectural to the side that you're building on? Not that often. So even if it is a little older, a lot of the stuff keeps up. Even if it is Drupal 8 and 9, not a lot change on the theme settings and a lot of the stuff like breakpoints and why not. So you can still rescue and learn some of that. So what is best? You have so many. Let me check on the time. Oh, what is best? You have so many choices. Paragraphs, Layout Builder, Single Directory Components, Delwin, Storybook. Uh, don't use Pattern Lab. If you're still using Pattern Lab, well, hopefully you can move away soon because I made that mistake. Pattern Lab was very promising and it was very enticing because you had a lot of the professional Drupal devs uh, promoting it and why not. And even Storybook nowadays. But the reality is sometimes they don't get used as much. Uh, it's more a developer and excite excitement tool than actually something that's going to get some feedback from either your VP or somebody else. So, you know, how, how much you get out of uh, a putting storybook or pattern in the middle varies. But at least for me, it's never really been something that they care much about. Uh, content editors don't really look at it, and designers do their own thing with uh, Figma anyway. But you can get some linters and testing frameworks out of that, uh, and hopefully you do. Because if anything, if you look at some of these, sometimes you can have some styling, some GitHub actions, and some other things that can save you time. So when do you use one of these themes? When you want to save, uh, uh, when should you use Starter Kit or something else? Well, when you want to start from scratch, should you hack Olivero? I've seen some people hack Olivero for their own profile or something else. You can. Olivero is fantastic. And you can also look into... Um, what is it called? The, the, the other one, uh, the other profile that we have in core that is for recipes, Umami. You can look at Umami because Umami has a lot of the SDC components. So you can take an example of that. But, but uh, you know, take that into consideration that sometimes they are a little more of what you need. And because they are core, they have a lot of extra things that you have to look into that maybe you didn't necessarily need at that point. Should you use an open source project? Uh, you can just be aware that it could be abandoned should you buy a theme who has bought a theme for drupal here from any of the stores i bought themes in the past just to see how they were built because themes have, give you like the promise of being like a recipe or a wordpress theme where it's kind of sort of uh, all the way there uh you don't have to do much uh and you can look at the code but uh but the problem is themes are usually not built for developers they are usually for end users so the CSS and the bundler is not usually uh, fully there or not fully tuned out. So that's something to keep in mind. But, but if you need an example, you could even buy one. So what should you do first? If you have a small team and you're looking into um, building one, uh, and you are kind of your own in-house agency because the university or some other institution have told you that you have to come up with it, take a look at the examples. Make sure that you look at the stuff that is out there first. Don't go, don't go build it without looking at what others have built in the past because you won't learn from the mistakes that they made and you're going to make them again. And it's going to be worse because it was you and you're going to still be working there likely uh, later and you're going to be fixing your own mistakes. So don't take risks that you don't have to take because you want to make your life easier in the future. Um, what are trade-offs have worth it? Uh, you know, uh, sometimes as developers, I have a computer science background. I know some people don't. I don't think it matters if you do and you don't, except for if you do, sometimes you try to uh, follow the dry principle of not repeating yourself and optimizing code and making stuff clean and uh, being able to like brag about something. But remember also, you have to keep it simple. And if you don't keep it simple, sometimes uh, optimizing something or having some sort of um, abstraction for whatever you did will make it complicated for you to document the stuff in the future. It will make it, uh, it, will make it problematic for you to uh, 
uh, explain that and extend it. And you know, look for components that are needs versus wants, because every VP, uh, every stakeholder that I work with, sometimes they think that they want something, but they don't know how to explain what the end product they want is. But you know there's variations of that, and you know there's different websites and different ways of handling that, and providing them with an example by looking at something else that somebody else built or some other site that is Drupal-based will give you that edge sometimes. So where do you look at? You look at the libraries file, the themes file, the breakthroughs files. Uh, you look about the compiler and a couple of other things. Now, key modules. This is uh, where it gets a little interesting. If you never use tweak file value, use tweak file value. That helps you avoid busting the cache because sometimes you're going too, uh, too, deep of the, uh, too deep inside of a paragraph or a component or a block and then you start doing the dot zero, dot uh, first value, dot something else, uh, last, whatever. If you do that, sometimes you get yourself into oddities and issues when it comes to fr refreshing the cache or with a component not behaving correctly. If you use tweak field value, you just do a filter so you put like, like a filter thing and then you do fill value and boom, out. You don't have to do DD and kind of dig down the three and then see where the heck that is. Use Twig Twig. Twig Twig is out there. I think most of the professional front end developers that I've seen use Twig Twig and benefit out of it. There's Form Dazzle. Form Dazzle, actually, the maintainer was here, John Alvin. That allows you to, if you have a form, you can cherry pick a button and change what style you want that button. That applies in Drupal if you have a Drupal form and you want to change like the submit, but not the reset button, you don't have to have a suggestion. Sometimes making suggestions for tweak components can be a little tricky, that takes care of that. And that note that I added in there is something that I noticed lately that it's pretty cool and it's on the next slide, so I'm gonna skip on that. Link purpose, link purpose just helps you with some of the accessibility that you can have on this side. Let me go here. Link purpose mixes up with editorially really well and universities use it and we use it at SBA because it gives you these icons to like, you can use EXT link and you might be familiar with EXT link, but this does it in a way that editorially doesn't complain about it and you have all the benefit of like deciding whether you want to have the external link or just the file download link, which increases a little bit of the accessibility of the site, depending on what you're doing there. And you didn't have to import those icons because they come built with it. You know, sometimes in front end, we do things that are unnecessary. We add a ton of icon libraries, we add a ton of DM uh, um, architectural libraries, sometimes you have Twig, I mean, sometimes you have uh, uh, Tailwind CSS and you have Bootstrap, but you didn't really need both, but you did it because somebody asked you for it. <laughs> Uh, and then you start accumulating some of that then. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, let me go to the next one. So timeless snippets. This is where this might be applied to you. This is something you might use this week. This is something you might use next week. How many have used the clean unique ID? Raise your hand. That thing came in on TED.1. What that allows you to do is sometimes if you have accordions, you wanna have a jump link to the heading of the accordion or to the accordion themselves. In the past, people used to use random to just make sure accordions didn't crash an ID. This generates a clean, unique ID so you could pass that variable called field heading, whether that's text or something, and it makes sure to strip out all of the code that uh, couldn't be on an ID, and also it adds a number at the end. So if you have something that is like, uh, timeless uh, uh, songs or something, and you have two of them, and both of them are a heading, the second one will have a dash dash two. So now you have unique headings that you don't really have to worry about. So it's really good for accordions, but it could be really handy for anything else where you need jump links. This here, this is a little bit of a front end hacky little thing. In USWDS, sometimes you wanna do a has not. And a has not is you don't want to have that class, or if it doesn't have the US card media, then uh, do this. But sometimes that's a little tricky because you can have a has if it has it, but how do you do a has not? You put a not in front of it. Uh, and that took me forever to find out. And I don't know if that's the cleanest implementation of it, but that will save you a ton of time because it just looks at the three and it clears that out. The third one, you want to have a. Um, 
you're using the SVG image field on your module, on your project, and you want to have some alt text that people can type into that field that is like a placeholder team and immediately takes out the alt text because, you know, sometimes if it is a decorative image, you don't want that. And if you do have it there, it's going to have some accessibility warnings. So just by doing that little piece of code, you don't have to add another module. That will strip that away and take it out. Now, I tried doing that with Twig. Uh, somebody who worked at the company before did that with Twig. And that's super hard to do with Twig because Twig doesn't let you access the alt text attribute or at least I didn't find out how, because for whatever reason it was like protected on the PHP. So, but if you do it on the on the hook, you can have that clear and out of the way. The last one, uh, who has used the clear fix? The clear fix kind of predates me a little bit. Uh, I mean, I heard about it, but I never had to use it. But with USWDS, if you have a card and the card has text that floats around it. And that's usually when they want to have that like card and the text come around to the bottom and it keeps going the paragraphs. Sometimes you want to use a clear fix at the bottom because I had an issue with SVA where they had an article. And if you didn't clear fix it, it will like mess up the whole page and move the layout of the page. So if you're familiar with clear fix, you know, you probably have heard of this before. But if you're newish to Drupal and newish to development, be familiar with clear fix because uh, floating images is an old technique and floating text but it's still useful and there's no really replacement for what it does fully. Uh, the other sites that you have is like Drupal X. Drupal X has SDC component support for it. And Jay, who used to work for uh, Media Current, has been doing a lot of stuff. If you don't follow him on LinkedIn, follow him on LinkedIn. He actually just changed some of this stuff yesterday. So he moved from Bootstrap to Tailwind and something else. Which is good and bad, right? Because like, you wish that the theme that you are uh, cloning is going to stay somewhat consistent for a little while, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes people emulsify, change their direction. They used to do pattern lab, and they used to do other stuff. And one day they decided to go to Storybook and gave you an upgrade path. And if you didn't like it, too bad. Because you kind of you sign up the OSS contract of, like, I will maintain it if, you know, things go south. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, it's good, and you should be thankful and, and grateful to them when you meet them. But what you started building might not be compatible where in the direction that they are going, and you might have to keep it on your own. Barbase. Barbase does something interesting with the tour module. So if you wanted to have a little tour, I don't know if you used that before. It used to be bigger in Drupal 8, and I think that took, I don't remember if it was, was it core? Anybody knows if it was Drupal core, the tour module? Or it was just contributed? It was core. I think they took it out of core, right? Uh, it was interesting because it basically walk you around the page like you will see in some other systems and why not. They have a demo of that. So if you install the distribution, you can see some of it and have the benefit of like playing around with it. Drupal GovCon 2017. If you're looking for opportunities to contribute to an active theme that they're using, GovCon has their uh, uh, theme open source. For that one, and for the Drupal for Gob, the Drupal for Gob is newer. Um, Belgrade, that's another one that I was talking about. This is the one that uh, uh, the commerce guys have. So now the biggest thing that I found that's useful out of the commerce guys, I haven't used Drupal Commerce much, but they have a lot of custom hooks that are really nice and neat and very creative. And they've done a lot of stuff with Layer Builder. So borrow their Drupal custom hooks. You know, Don't be shy to just go in there and take the pieces that you like. I mean, it takes a little bit to set it up, and they have this thing called a Belgrade cheat sheet, which is basically compiles their styles and it builds a kitchen sink, if you are familiar with that, which used to be like before Pattern Lab and Storybook, it's just a page dump that has all their components. That can be pretty useful and it can be, can solve like, uh, oh, my stakeholder wants a Storybook or a Pattern Lab. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they just want to have something built with some cards and some stuff that shows the components that you have. That could be simpler. Florida Drupal Camp, that is the main site, as you can see, very similar to the ones that you guys have, very similar to the one that Chattanooga has, because we all borrow a lot of the stuff that Mike did. But Mike, interesting enough, for Olivero, a lot of the coding Olivero is a little harder to read and sometimes to piece out. But in the Florida Drupal Camp, he, because he was doing it a little faster and it wasn't really core, he put some of the things that he learned in there, like the focus trap for uh, like the menu system on a mobile view. So borrow some of that stuff because that makes it more accessible. It gives you some of the flexibility. The JavaScript is available and out there. Uh, I mean, everybody should probably just go to his repo and then take some of that stuff out. Emulsify. 
um, I added it in here even though I didn't really have a demo of that one. And the reason why I added it is because, you know, they're being big in the space and they have a storybook integration. They have Webpack, they do a lot of stuff. They also have UI patterns, which I don't know how many people use UI patterns anymore. Anybody use UI patterns? Used to be like SDC kind of, but like a different take on it. The only thing with them, and I guess that's something that we can all learn, is like whenever a project decides to have a CLI, it means that their complexity has increased too much. And now it's not as easy for me as an end user to test you out or to check you out. And I have to install another uh, command line uh, tool to install your thing. And sometimes the repo is split into two, three, four themes uh, for uh, GitHub repos because now you have to call different things and you couldn't really see the theming files themselves because they get built at runtime. So all that to say, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that's fully still supported or they're abandoning that. I know they're trying to do some stuff with recipes, but this is something that you get with companies, you know, like different agencies, good and bad. You know, I mean, they contribute a lot to Drupal and why not for kitchens? fantastic company but sometimes you know some other projects die and that's for any other company but yeah something to keep in mind drupal for gov this is the website that i was telling you about that website is open source mike herschel did a lot of the work if you know him and if you follow some of his work he has sdc components he has sdc examples which is great because sometimes you get the SDC component, but you don't have an example on how to call that SDC thing. And then you are like, oh, I don't even know how to work with Extend or some of the other items. If you do like Tailwind, I mean, I show you a lot of the things that they have on the American side of themes, but Europe has a lot of other people that work on other themes and other open source stuff. It's just, I didn't aggregate it all because it's a lot of stuff out there, but there's a Tailwind CSS project that Oliver Davies maintains. So if you like Tailwind, you could start there and you could start looking at some of the things that you could take out of that one and or may, maybe use on your own. Some themes have a suggested sub theme, sub theme, theme inside of it. Be careful when you do that. Even USWDS base has a sub theme. It's nice to have it because you can see how they are calling the parent, but sometimes you can flatten that up and then just create your own base on what feedback they have in there. And you don't need to take on having a sub theme of something else uh, when you already have all the benefit of having it there. So if, if you don't have to sub theme, don't do it because I had a couple of projects in the past and undoing a sub theme is really hard later in the future because now you have to make sure that you install just the parent theme and not the sub theme and you absorb all that stuff and you have extra technical debt right there. So that's it from that and I know I'm a little bit over time so if there is any questions I will take those now and I could probably show some of the demos uh, for some of these other stuff like maybe DrupalCon 2017 and some of the stuff with commerce for those who want to stay a little longer uh, but any questions go ahead yeah so i'm kind of like a i like to base simple as much as possible right kind of stacking stuff on top mm -hmm. of things i've been more interested in the uh, components what is a good is drupal for gov a good one to start as far as using components and maybe like a more simple breakdown or what's the way to get kind of like a most classy or stark and then build on top of it or just do your own thing and then you have full control uh, so sdc is great just using drupal templates is great as well i don't know that either approach you are going wrong but you have to be aware of what the trade-offs are. Uh, with SDC, something that you get is that you don't have to set up JavaScript libraries, you don't have to set up CSS, because it already handles some of the stuff for you. Um, I think a combination of what Umami does, because already is a core theme for SDC, a combination of that with what Drupal for God did, with what um, even, f I don't think Florida's theme actually uses components. I think Mike, uh, that predates uh, his SDC journey. Uh, but but a combination of all of them, of them will give you a starting point to like decide which way you wanna go and also look at some examples. Because the biggest thing with SDC, 
The only thing I don't necessarily like as much so far, but I haven't used it much, so uh, you know, take that as uh, uh, for what counts, is the YAML file that you have to have and the schema that you have to generate with SDC and whatnot. It's just an extra layer of complexity that you have in there. It's really nice if you're gonna reuse some items, similar to Pattern Lab and Storybook. You know, the promise of being able to look at something and then have a theme that can be used for a thousand sites or have a different variation of the theme is really good but your mileage may vary because of that. But yeah, I will definitely look at uh, this one. This one, uh, if you just go to that repo, then you can take a look at it, kind of like the stuff that he did in there. And then some other people took over because there's a bunch of volunteers and they actually left tweak debugging on this side. So you can see some of the tweak. Uh, I put an issue in there, but I don't think they've seen it yet. Um, does SDC as well, isn't it? Um, I think the latest version does SDC, yes. I know at the beginning, I think he started just with tweak templates, and the latest version does Tailwind, and the latest version does Chaz CDN or something like that. Uh, so that's something. And, and Drupal X, interesting enough, I didn't show it, but I have it here, is really easy to set up. It might be the easiest of, the, of them all to set up because he's actually using recipes. And uh, so when you install it, you just create a project, you tell it to install, and boom, it's done. Some of these take a little bit. Don't be super frustrated if you are installing one of these and you cannot get it to work or sometimes you're like, what the heck is happening here? It's usually your local environment. Sometimes you have to point something else. You have to clear the cache. But yeah, it's a couple of things there. Any other questions? Caveat to Drupal GovCon is they're probably changing their theme here. Yeah. Next year, so. <laughs> oh, well, and that's an opportunity too. Which is a need. Yeah. yeah. And actually, for the Drupal GovCon 2017, I was talking to them at GovCon last year, and I did a little work with them to actually add DDEP. So if you're adding DDEP, there is a DDEP starting uh, point right there. So you could spin it up and look at some of the stuff they have in there and learn from some of their challenges because they did use like a SAS breakpoints plugin to like break some of the stuff, and it's a little dated. I, I saw that, and I was like, ooh, that probably be a little problematic. It might be easier to do a clean start, but that is a really old theme, and it's still up and running, so some of the benefits that you can get out of that. So Drupal X. Drupal X has a boilerplate starter right out of the box. Uh, so you can look at some of the stuff that he has in here. Although if you look at the code for Drupal X, you can tell that he used some of the stuff that a media current used on Rain and some of the other stuff. Because, you know, most developers don't build the theme again from scratch. Mm -hmm. Usually you keep moving junk along. Some junk is more useful than others, but then you are like, oh, you know, this was useful before. Let me start with these files and see what I remove. So you might see some stuff behind the scenes that you are like, mm, this is a new theme, but it has some old stuff. Uh, so something to keep in mind. But uh, yeah, a nice one to explore as well. Any other questions? And if not, I hope you can take advantage of this. Take a look at this project. Look at the Florida one volunteer with your local camp and group make sure you uh look at the examples you know uh, and um and yeah good luck thank you